Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Pradeep Kumar. I am the uh, uh, chair for the uh, uh, Oregon chapter of the Comstock Society. Uh, and with me uh, as, as a moderator for the event is the vice chair, Raf Varathambi. Uh, this event is co hosted by many other chapters. We have 10 chapters all together, uh, uh, namely the Seattle Comp Society, the Oregon Computer Society. Uh, Tucson Com Society, Santa Clara Com Society, Sacramento Valley Com Society, uh, Orange County uh, Society, a Com Society, Central Texas, Foothills, and the Coastal Los Angeles section. So welcome all of you here to our meeting. And um, uh, we have a, a bunch of uh, other events coming up. We have another event. It is on uh, AI-based zero uh, energy communication that's on the 21st of September. So, uh, and we have a bunch of others that uh, uh, you'll soon see uh, the uh, broadcast that I'll be sending out too. Uh, and then also, if any of you wants the transcript and the recordings uh, from our events, uh, you can head over to the Oregon Comstock site. If you Google it, you'll find it. And uh, in the archive section, uh, you'll find you know, typically I'll post the event, the links to the YouTube video, and you know, so you don't have to uh, uh, take notes or whatever. If you miss anything, don't worry about it. You can head over there to, uh, you know, uh, do uh, access the videos and things like that. And with that, I will hand over to Raf Vanathambi uh, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Pradeep. Um, so my name is Raf Vanathambi. Um, uh, very happy to. Uh, introduce our speaker uh, and my friend, you know, Dr. Claudia da Silva. Uh, he's a communication society distinguished lecturer. He's going to talk about Wi-Fi sensing and the uh, IEEE standards associated with that, which is IEEE 802.11bf. Uh, he's the technical editor for this specification. So how wonderful it is to directly hear from the editor of this specification. Um, so Dr. Claudio De Silva is a um, wireless system engineer at the uh, Reality Labs group of Meta Platforms, formerly known as Facebook, and is responsible for the standardization of wireless connectivity technologies and for advancing spectrum policy strategy. Uh, before joining uh, Meta Platforms, um, Claudia was with uh, Intel Corporation in Next Generation and Standards Group, where he was responsible for driving um, technology and product uh, innovations by leading the and contributing to various standardization, certification, and regulatory activities. During his tenure at Intel, he also served as a technical editor for a Wi-Fi Alliance 60 gigahertz. Before Intel, he was at uh, Samsung uh, Mobile Solutions Lab. Before that, he was an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. So Da Silva, um, uh, Dr. Da Silva uh, received his BS and MS from the State University of Campinas, uh, Brazil, and the PhD degree from the University of California, San Diego, all in electrical engineering. Uh, he was an editor for IEEE uh, Transaction and Communications, and now currently he is serving as the guest editor for the IEEE Communications magazine. Uh, he has served on a technical program committee of numerous uh, IEEE conferences uh, in communication area. Um, he is a senior member of IEEE. Um, so with any further do you, uh, let's welcome our speaker to talk about this um, Wi-Fi sensing, an interesting topic, and welcome, Claudia. Yeah, thanks. And well. sorry, one more thing that sure. I already spoke with Claudia, and he is um, a generous that, you know, he, you know, okay, anybody, you know, just wanted to ask a question, interrupt and disturb, ask question, make it interactive. So anybody have question? If too many question comes, we will uh, control it in some way. Otherwise you can uh, ask the question directly, you know, you know um, uh, unmute and ask the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Yeah, thanks, Rev. And uh, thanks, Pradeep, as well. And no, thanks everyone for calling in. 
I'm super happy to be here uh, with you and talk a little bit about Wi-Fi sensing and more specifically, uh, this new IEEE 2.11BF standard. And as Raf mentioned, you know, I'm certainly open for, for questions as we go. But hey, if we're not able to answer our questions or uh, if you like to reach out later and just with any questions or for anything else, please, you know, do feel free to, to do so. You know, uh, you can find me on the web, on LinkedIn. And again, it would be a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to meet you. And hopefully we can continue, you know, uh, 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 interacting with each other. So uh, with that, I will share my screen and the presentation. Uh, here we go. And uh, there is one thing that you know I need to emphasize. Uh, actually, I need your guys' help. If I move this out of the way, can you still see me or yes. not really? I can see very well. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So I want to emphasize one point that uh, Ref and Pradeep made, which is that I'm here today with you, uh, basically as part of IEEE Consoc's uh, Distinguished Lecture Program which means that I'm not here officially on behalf of my employer, uh, Meta Platforms, nor of the IEEE Euro 2 working group. Okay, so this presentation was prepared by me, was not revealed by anyone, and I assume no other responsibility for any errors uh, that is in it. But again, that's an important point to, to make. All right, and with that, let's go to uh, the presentation. And the presentation today is actually you know, a discussion with you of two different, not chief, two different, but correlated topics, uh, Wi-Fi sensing and the new IEEE 2.11BF uh, standard, which is still under development. And just so we have an idea, I'm going to spend about 30% of our time today uh, talking about Wi-Fi sensing in general, and then the remaining part of the time on the standard. And actually, you know, just the transition between these two topics might be a good time for us to stop for a few minutes and see if there are any questions. Hey, but still, you know, if you have any questions, you know, just let us know. All right, so again, let's begin with the first part, which is just brief introduction to Wi-Fi sensing. And uh, here I define uh, sensing as a process of acquiring information about the environment, including objects and targets within it. Specifically for the type of applications that Wi-Fi sensing support, and those applications that, are in, uh, that uh, I had the opportunity to work on just last few years, uh, what, how we are going to use, how we use sensing is basically a way to enable electronic devices, such as computers, laptops, uh, cell phones, to become aware of their surroundings, including their users. And just to ground that a little bit, let me give you three examples of you know, commercial systems that you can, of products that you can find the market today that use sensing. And here is the first one, which is uh, a sensing system that is used for proximity detection uh, in, a, in a laptop computer that is on the market today by Lenovo, it's a ThinkPad X1. And they, have, they are using sensing, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about the technology they use in the next slide to basically detect when a user approaches the device and they do that in order to basically unlock, uh, speed up the login process, and also detect when the user walks away in order to, you know, basically go into a power saving mode. And again, that's in the market already. A second example that you can see there in the screen is from uh, BMW, and it's a technology that has been around for a few years, I would say five, six years, in which they are using sensing for gesture recognition, gesture control. So instead of you know, touching the screen of the car to change the music or turn the volume up or down, you can make you know, uh, gestures on the air and, uh, and interact with the system in, in, in that way. So actually that is a very interesting and powerful uh, application just because it shows that we can enable new forms of user interface with electronic devices. Right, that go beyond touching, beyond voice. Now we're interacting with you know, electronic devices through gestures. And then finally, a third example, uh, just one come, comes from Google. Uh, Google has 
uh, you know, has a lot of interest in this area sensing. They have something called Project Soleil that some of you might be aware of. And as part of the project, they are developed, they have developed different solutions. And the first one that came to market was for gesture recognition in their phones. And more recently, they have what I have there in the screen, which is an S hub in which they use sensing for uh, sleep tracking. Okay, so it's a device that is, you know, by your bedside and basically tracks, you know, how well you sleep during the night. So uh, the first, possibly for some of you, you know, the first key thing that comes to your mind when you see these pictures is that sensing is, you know, some sort of a radar, right? It's a form of radar. And that wouldn't be uh, too far away, right? Sensing, typically we see that as a broader technology that does not necessarily rely on radar technology. And so, but still radar has been around for several decades, right? And uh, it's important to see that now we are kind of an inflection point in the technology because just technology that had you know, military applications and uh, well, a cop on the side of this, the highway, right? Seeing if you're speeding. Now they are getting into you know, everyday consumer electronic devices. And that is a combination of different factors, right? So for example, one of them is that different companies have invested in actually miniaturizing uh, this technology, sense technology, or even radar technology into chips that you know, consume you know, the power, the, the, the level of power and they are of the size that you know, we can incorporate them into electronic platforms. And there is also something else which is um, machine learning, computing in general. Several of these technologies that we uh, have, are going to see today, uh, they do rely on machine learning in order to estimate parameters, to make decisions, to do pattern recognition. And so, again, it's a combination of factors that made, you know, again, sensing in general uh, become uh, adopted, right, by everyday consumer electronics. So, but having said that, right, it's extremely important to recognize that wireless sensing, right, sensing based on radio waves is just one of many different ways, right, of enabling sensing. Others include cameras, sensors, uh, ultrasound. But sensing, uh, wireless sensing does have you know, some unique characteristics that make it very interesting uh, to certain applications. So for example, it preserves privacy to an extent, right? Image, video is not captured. Uh, for example, there are applications today uh, using sensing to basically monitor elder people, right? You, you really don't have, right, to have cameras over the house to monitor a person. Uh, wireless sensing, uh, it, it works better for applications like that. And also does not depend on the light. For example, that sleep tracking device, right? If it was a camera, it wouldn't capture what is needed for different reasons, one of them including light. You can see through materials. And a good example of that is you know, uh, is that different from a camera? And you can just look at your phone and see how many cameras you can see. A radar can be below, right? The plastic or the any, not any material, but material that you know basically covers that you cannot and you cannot see it. And the ability to detect very fine movement. And in turn, right? What else? Uh, what else? Sensors can be implemented with multiple technologies, right? One of them is radar, right? And by radar here, I basically meaning. Uh, FMCW, frequency modulated continuous waveform technology, uh, which is very popular. Uh, Wi Fi, uh, ultra wideband, UWB, and cellular. Uh, some of you, I assume, uh, come from a cellular background and you see, and you know, possibly better than me, that sensing is one of the key technologies being considered today in the context of 6G. And it's also important to recognize, right, that each of these technologies, right, wireless and non-wireless, and even inside, you know, the wireless technologies, uh, they have their own characteristics. And truly, there is like uh, not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, basically, everything depends on the application that you are uh, trying to support. Uh, that application will, will have some requirements, right, as far as the actual radio uh, technology goes. 
And depending on the technology that you use, think for example, cellular compared to radar, uh, they will be able to support only to a point, right? So signal characteristics, the architecture, both the radar architecture and the network architecture uh, and the protocol, they will all together uh, define, right? What applications you are able to support. And in that context, right, and that's the uh, our focus for in today's discussion, uh, we have Wi-Fi sensing, right? And what I mean by Wi-Fi sensing is just process of acquiring information uh, of the environment or of a user through the detection and processing of 802.11 signals or 802.11 packets. And I want to discuss in you know, a lot more detail what that means uh, in a few slides. And the idea here truly is to take, you know, Wi-Fi hardware and software, right, that you use for communications. And hopefully only with, you know, software level modifications, enable that hardware to give information necessary to support a sensing application. And that is doable because uh, 802.11 packets, right, or 802.11 signals, they already include uh, in their packet structure different training symbols that today that they are used to estimate the channel to do the informing. But then those uh, signals, they allow you to estimate the channel and sensing, and that's exactly what sensing needs, right? Uh, the channel basically capture, right? Uh, how that signal trans, uh, uh, traveled, right? From a transmitter to the receiver and we'll capture everything that is in that environment, right? Or well, not everything, but characteristics of that environment. So we already have, right, in the Rutsudok level signals that we use today, that ability to acquire that information about the environment and uh, estimate, right, what is happening, what is going on there. The feasibility of Wi-Fi sensing has been studied, you know, for decades. And uh, here on the right hand side of the slide, you know, I have a few examples of that. Uh, you know, people have done use the Wi Fi sensing to, you know, sense through walls to do um, breathing rate and heart rate estimation, just you name it. That's an extremely popular area of research. If you go to Triple Explore and look for it, you'll be surprised with, you know, the hundreds of papers, if not thousands, that come on that. And more recently, uh, what we have seen is that commercial applications are coming to the market today that rely on Wi-Fi sensing. And I want to give one example in the next slide. So today, even without a standard, right, uh, you can buy a Wi-Fi solution, right, for certain applications. All right, so let's dig deeper on Wi-Fi sensing and also, let's dig deeper on uh, why we can use, or if we can determine what, if we can use uh, Wi-Fi for sensing. So it is very hard to talk about sensing in radar without talking about uh, certain characteristics, right? Certain limits that those technologies can uh, achieve. And one uh, parameter that is uh, of great importance for sensing in radar is something called range resolution, right? Which is the ability to separate targets, right? Uh, within a certain distance, roughly speaking. And sensing res uh, and uh, range resolution is given by C divided, which is the speed of light in va vacuum divided by two times the bandwidth. And on the left-hand side, here the slides, I have a plot of range resolution versus bandwidth. And I indicate there the different technologies uh, the bandwidth corresponds to different technologies. And for Wi-Fi, right, we are typically operating at 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz. If you are really lucky, 160 megahertz. So if you use that equation, you see that the range of resolution that you can achieve with a reader, with a Wi-Fi signal, is actually pretty bad, right? This is on the order of a few meters. And that is bad, especially compared to, for example, FMCW, right, a radar technology. 
uh, especially the ones in operating in the millimeter wave band, where you can operate over two gigahertz, three gigahertz, actually even more than that, seven gigahertz. So as you increase the bandwidth by two orders of magnitude, the range resolution also redu reduces by two orders of magnitude. So if you look at FMCW and Wi-Fi 60 gigahertz, uh, you're talking about having a resolution of a few centimeters as opposed to a few meters, right? So it is extremely, uh, so that is a limitation of the technology, right? Of Wi-Fi, what Wi-Fi can do. Uh, you should not expect, for example, to do you know, a fine gesture recognition, gesture control type of application with Wi-Fi. It's basically physics, right? You won't be achieve or obtain the range resolution necessary to support that application. And then there is also a second issue with Wi-Fi that we have to be careful, which is the architecture of the system. And specifically in Wi-Fi, we are either operating in a B-static or a multi-static uh, architecture. But this is something that we're going to discuss in two slides. So I'm just going to make a pointer to that, but ask you to hold on for a second because we're going to discuss that in more detail in a second. But anyway, so, uh, well, things don't look good for Wi-Fi sensing, right? When you look at range resolution and architecture as well. So what is the catch here, right? So why are you here listening to just talk on Wi-Fi sensing if there is not much we can do with that? Well, uh, the value proposition of Wi-Fi sensing is that, you know, our houses, our places of employment, uh, you, we already have a surprisingly large number of Wi-Fi devices around, right? Think of your house, smart TV, right? Uh, cell phones, uh, uh, smart speakers, and they are, right, in different places of your house. So what that allows you to do is, instead of obtaining one measurement, right, you are able to obtain today, right, without deploying any new hardware, to obtain multiple measurements. They will certainly be, you know, low resolution, but given that you have multiple measurements, and not only that, but those measurements, they are uh, uh, obtained with different links that cover different things in your house. If you combine all those multiple measurements in an intelligent way, and typically, you know, this is where machine learning comes at, uh, is used, uh, you are able to support very interesting applications. And here's one example uh, here on the left-hand side. This is a system that is already commercially available, which is called the Linksys Aware. And basically they, what they are doing is they are using your Wi-Fi network in your house to enable, uh, to basically perform presence detection, okay? So the idea is that once you leave your house, you let, using an app, you let the app, on, app know, hey, I'm leaving my house, thinking me if something changes, if someone gets in. Well, you have all those sensors, right, giving information, right, on while you are away. And it's fairly easy for you to detect right, changes in the environment using wireless sensing, right? That's pretty much, you know, uh, to an extent a binary problem, right? If there is no one in the house, you are estimating channels, right, over time, and those channels are not expected to change, right? But if they do change, it means that the environment changed. So it means that in this application that someone entered the house. So again, a lot of uh, low resolution measurements, but obtained with links that cover right different areas. By intelligent combining them, not only can detect presence, but you can even uh, detect where presence happens, uh, where movement happens, uh, where is motion coming from, from the living home, room or the bedroom. That is something that you can do even with you know low resolution 20 megahertz measurements. And uh, and one possible way of doing that, and again, this has been a very popular uh, area of, of research for quite a number of years, is through something called CSI tracking, right? And the, 
possibly the best way to explain is looking at these figures on the right hand side, uh, which were actually, you know, uh, obtained here in Portland, actually, which is house where I am in now. So uh, here on the left, uh, upper two figures, you have uh, basically the channel estimated by a Wi Fi device. Here we have the amplitude on the left hand side and the phase on the right hand side. And each one of these curves corresponds to the channel obtained with one Wi Fi packet. And I performed the experiment over three, five minutes. And each packet I received, I plot this, uh, the CSI here. And as you can see, if there was no movement, in this case, there was no movement in the house, uh, you see that they overlap each other, right? And that is very different compared to these figures on the bottom. And here, the opposite happened. So in this experiment, we had a transmitter and receiver uh, inside the house. And uh, basically, there was movement right in the same room where that, those measurements were being taken. And as you can see, channel fluctuates over time. In this case, again, that three, five minutes that I mentioned before. Okay, so CSI tracking is you know, just approach of you obtaining uh, basically snapshots of the channel over time and specifically, you know, the, the channel impulse response or the channel frequency response and track how those changes happen. So again, and just, uh, as we're going to see uh, in the second part of this talk, uh, in Nero 2.11 BF, we do not assume a particular way of, uh, obit of uh, using uh, measurements. So this is just one example that I'm giving you for reference. And the second topic. Uh, um, sorry, yeah. um, Claudio, you know, just to break the silence, you know, sure. I will ask you a question. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, you know, here, you know, you are showing, you know, uh, the difference between, you know, no movements and the movements, but I cannot see the, uh, um, like, a, like a, you know, what is the axis numbers and all, but there are, you know, it's not a single line and a thick line, right? A thick line and a thick line, but thicker line. You know, how much of difference would tell you that there is a moment versus there is no? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me begin by telling you what are the axes. And I'm sorry that it is so super small. So here on the X axis, this is basically the subcarrier index, right? So it is about 11 is OFDM, uh, OFDM system. So in this case, we're estimating 50, 60 plus subcarriers. Right, so again, this is the, the basically the frequency uh, in the x-axis, and in the y-axis here we have the uh, the magnitude of the channel impulse response. Obviously, that is normalized by the receiver that I used, and uh, on the right-hand side that is the uh, phase of that C uh, CIR. So, uh, what do you need in order to estimate movement? Right. So, uh, unfortunately. The answer is, it depends, right? And it depends specifically on, well, the reliability and the resolution that your application require. And not only that, but also the, um, uh, what application are you trying to serve? So for this case here of, in which our goal was just detecting if there is a person moving in the environment, uh, it was super easy to, to detect that movement. and. You can see here, right, uh, in just figures what happened. Uh, but obviously, that was a somewhat controlled environment in the sense, you know, we had a transmitter and receiver in, in the same room. Uh, so the SNR was super large. Uh, but that is that would be different, for example, of, uh, for example, detecting if a person, uh, if you want to recognize what type of movement it's happening, right? For example, is the person, you know, just in a chair typing away, or is the person walking, or is the person running? Then that will impose right different requirements on th those measurements that are obtained. And you know, bandwidth, uh, SNR, uh, that will have an impact. So unfortunately, the answer is again, it depends on the application. Okay, thank you. And sure. you know, so you know, this is you know, it can bring false alarm or um uh like you know. But, you know, for that kind of things, you know, probably, you know, the standards must have, uh, you know, have some some threshold and things like that you probably are going to talk about, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, things are not 
pretty like this uh, in real life. Right. Uh, even in, uh, so for example, uh, a known behavior that is really bad for sensing is that even in a static environment, transmitters and receivers, they are always trying to do better, right? And they make adapt, uh, 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 they adapt over time, right? They can increase power, reduce power. They can change the informing settings. So even in static environment, you can see, for example, completely different uh, CIRs after a point because the transmitter just changed the way that it's doing beforeing. Okay, so all of that does have an impact. It does cause false alarms. And that's actually one of the reasons why we are developing standard as we want to talk next, because we want to clean up that as much as we can. Claudia, may I yes. ask a question? This sure, of course. Okay. Um, I have a question in this um, experiment. Do you just use the or already existing uh, Wi-Fi receiver point, or you have additional hardware, or is this only rely on software? Yeah, so this was done using, you know, devices bought out of, out of Amazon a couple of years ago, so completely commercial software, I'm sorry, com commercial devices. Uh -huh. The only thing that was different is that we had a special firmware that allows us to extract the channel estimate from the receiver. And the, the four, four graphs you put on the up, upper right hand. Sure. Are they mm -hmm. represent only the channel information or does it carry the special uh, special res, uh, resolution, like uh, the location of the movement? No, no, no. So this was, uh, you know, completely what we got out of the hardware. Yes. Uh, and in this case was a 20 megahertz, you know, 802.11 uh, device. Okay. There was really nothing special. This is, uh, well, we did do, you know, some processing to, for example, uh, clean up uh, time offset and phase okay. offset, but, you know, really nothing super fancy, just basic, you know, signal processing that we do for communication signals. And do you have a time access like to show as time changes, how this, this signals moved? Uh, so uh, we did publish those results, both uh, in IEEE 02, as you can see here, if you type, if you Google this number, uh, you get, you likely get the contribution where I presented results and there is a whole yes. lot more information there. Uh -huh. uh, we also did publish uh, a paper on it. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately I don't have the data, that mm -hmm. lecture just graphs anymore since I changed okay. jobs uh, after I performed that work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'll be happy to help you find more information about it. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate You're very it. welcome. Question about the, um, the, oh. the aggregated graph. How long had you collected data to, to do um, the scatter plot? I'm just seeing how, what's the latency, how long do you need to do the, what kind of update rate you, you'll be able to get from this uh, simple experiment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, sure. So in this case, the signals that we were detecting, uh, they are what we call beacon frames that, you know, in all APs, right, or routers you have, uh, they transmit those frames every 100 milliseconds. So the sampling frequency or sampling period was 100 uh, milliseconds. And uh, in this case here, again, it, it, has, it, it was a while back. Yeah, it just I like, think it was like three, yeah, five minutes. Yeah, ballpark, is it like 10 seconds or a minute? No, no, three, five minutes. So three, five minutes, you'll be okay. gaining 10 measurements per second. Okay, I see. So it's like a few minutes, minutes, you collect the data a few minutes and you can process it and then you, you can do a mesh yeah. update and, and like the, in minutes. And, and the processing was all done off, offline. I see. Uh, yeah, so it just was really just a proof of concept type okay. of thing. Sure. Claudio, could I ask one more question? Uh, of course. Um, so I'm, you know, for the use cases that you provided, motion detection, um, maybe as, as an easier one, and then distinguishing between running and walking is a more challenging one. Um, are the signal levels that are required for successful processing of those cases similar to what we'd expect to see in a typical residential or enterprise environment, let's say minus 70 dB-ish RSSIs? I, I mean, I know there's no one simple answer, but 
yeah. another way of saying this is would people have to increase the density of Wi-Fi transmitters to be able to distinguish between these different scenarios? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, again, so in IEEE Euro 2, right, we basically build or we specify the building blocks, right, which specifically is how to obtain those curves, right? We don't get into the application level, uh, application layer. So unfortunately, again, uh, the answer for your question is everything depends a lot on the application and how that application is implemented. But what I can tell you is, uh, yes, it definitely depends on SNR, right? A as one example, uh, if you go on the web, uh, there is an organization called WBA, the Wireless Broadband Alliance, and they have a group on sensing there and they have published results that, for example, uh, they map uh, they basically go to, uh, to different houses and obtain SNR measurements, and they also apply you know, a commercial Wi-Fi sensing for presence detection in that house. And it's pretty clear, again, uh, I encourage you to take a look at that report, that yes, you know, if you go to the basement, right, where you have poor Wi-Fi coverage, if you have poor Wi-Fi coverage, you're going to have poor Wi-Fi sensing, period. Right, there is no way around that. So there is absolutely no a, a, a connection there between Wi-Fi coverage, SNR, and sensing, and that can get worse or better. Right, they really depend on the application. Right, because again, each application will have a different requirement. So SNR is just one value. Right, there is also the frequency in which you sample that environment. Right. So unfortunately today, uh, these applications they don't have much control over that because there is no standard that supports sensing, which is another thing that 11BF is doing. But uh, so typically how that is done today is that uh, they, these systems, they generate traffic on purpose just so they receive more packets and they estimate the channel more times and have those measurements passed to the application. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you know, systems typically go from 10 milliseconds for a sampling period, right, of 10 milliseconds all the way to a couple hundred milliseconds. Uh, how much do you need? Again, unfortunately, it also depends on the application that you're trying to support. And then there is also bandwidth, right? So for example, in just examples that I have here, I use uh, beacon frames, right? Just because again, beacon frames they are always transmitted every 100 milliseconds. But the problem is that that is a legacy waveform, so it's transmitted over 20 megahertz. And uh, current systems, not only they, right, they can support wider bandwidth, but current systems are also MIMO, right? So number of transmit antennas, number of receive antennas also has an impact on the, on the performance of those applications. So today is very hard without a standard to have control over those parameters. Right, but as we're going to see in a few minutes in 11BF, we are basically enabling a way, right, for applications to talk with an 802.11 device and request parameters, uh, measurements with certain parameters. But what those parameters are depends on the application. Thank you. Did you answer the question, Mark? Yes, you did. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Carter, one, one last question. So how sure. does Wi-Fi sensing compare to BLE presence sensing? Are there a lot of similarities and and any different things? Yeah. So BLE, it is a narrow band system, mm -hmm. right? That hops. So since it's a narrow band system, its range of resolution, believe it or not, is worse than, than, than yeah. Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing against it. And the other thing is just range, right? The range of, of a Bluetooth. I see. Yeah, because most of small. them is very proximity sensing for, for BLE. Right? Yeah. So again, can we use BLE for sensing? Absolutely, we can. The question is, does BLE offer the what you need, right, for I your see. application? Right, application yeah. context, I see. Another technology that people are using, uh, uh, considering today for sensing is UWB. Mm. Right? So UWB is a, actually a mix between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in the sense that it does have wider bandwidth, uh, but the range is also small. 
So uh, UWB for short range applications, uh, UWB actually has been the technology that's receiving more attention, more so than BLE. But you can absolutely implement it with BLE. Yeah, it's just BLE has been been there for a while and then people know about it. <laughs> oh yeah, they do. And trust me, there, there are people looking to it. <laughs> I have no right. question. Um, I'm sorry question. to interrupt. I think, you know, we had more than 15 minutes of questions. <laughs> I think, you know, we had to, sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, we, right. um, I think Claudia would be happy to stay and answer more questions. Uh, you know, at least, you know, let him to, you know, talk about his things a little bit more. Uh, you know, we can, you can jump in, uh, you know, at least, you know, let him talk for another 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so yeah, let, let's keep going. And again, uh, we might stop, you know, uh, in a few minutes to take more questions. Um, all right. So something else that is extremely important uh, that I would like to discuss with you today is architecture. Okay. So uh, just does have an impact on the standard. Uh, but this has also uh, a lot of impact on the applications that we can uh, address, support. Right? And basically, we have three different types of you know, sensing or radar architecture. The first one is what you call the monostatic. And that's the trans when the transmitter and the receiver, they are co-located. So think about a cop on the side of the highway measuring how far, how fast you are going. Right? It's a radar gun. That gun transmits the signal and receives the signal. So that is a monostatic implementation. Then there is a second possible way of doing sensing, which is just be static. And in this case, the transmitter and the receiver, they're different devices, right? So uh, basically the coverage area goes from, you know, a circle around the device, kind of if you're not using anything directional, to basically an ellipse that covers the transmitter, the receiver, and it's going to measure whatever is in that path, right? between transmitter and receiver. And then there is a third possible way, which is called multi-static. And in this case, we basically have spatially diverse uh, B-static implementations. So a possible way of seeing this is a router, right? A Wi-Fi router that is talking with multiple devices, right? For in this figure here, the smart TV, and don't know, a smart speaker by the bedside. So in this case, now you basically have the intersection, right? Or the union, depending on how you combine that, of two different ellipses. So which one of these architectures work best? Well, uh, again, unfortunately it depends, right? So uh, the monostatic case, it's good because basically you have control over the transmitter and the receiver, right? Especially if you have, uh, so you can detect everything that's around the environment and as long as you know, as you are allowed to transmit with the powers large as necessary to cover that area, you're going to get you know, the measurements that you get that, that, that you need. However, that does require right, some sort of full duplex implementation, right? Because your device has to transmit and receive signals approximately at the same time. And Wi-Fi devices, they are super low-cost technology. And uh, even though it has been shown that we can implement it to eleven in a full duplex way, commercial systems today, they don't do that, right? And doing that will require work, right? Possibly additional hardware. But one thing that Wi-Fi can do is the be static case, right? So imagine, for example, that this is your cell phone talking with a router, right? So in that case, you can have be static sensing using those two devices. But Wi-Fi also allows you to do multi-static device uh, sensing, right? So if you have a router here and then you know, cell phone and smart TV on the other hands. So when we talk about Wi-Fi, we are talking about to be static and multi-static, right? So let's go back to that gesture recognition, gesture control type of application. Which implementation will be better? Unfortunately, it will be the monostatic. Unfortunately for Wi-Fi sensing, it's monostatic, right? The best way is for you to illuminate the fingers and capture that signal. Uh, can you do with a B static, mode static? Uh, possibly yes, especially if you have control over the environment, but it will be challenging, right? You can be doing your gesture in front of the uh, cell phone, for example, but if someone walks past you, right? Or even close to the router, you're going to capture that motion as well. So, 
that also has, again, an impact on what you can do with Wi-Fi sensing. And we're actually going to come back to this point uh, later on uh, in this presentation, if we have time. <laughs> All right, guys, so that was it for Wi-Fi sensing, uh, just a brief introduction to Wi-Fi sensing. I hope that was interesting. I'm glad that we had the chance to answer a few questions. So let's jump into the Wi-Fi sensing standard now, 802.11bf. So as we discussed before, uh, Wi-Fi sensing has been successfully demonstrated for decades and commercially uh, and commercialized for uh, you know, a few years but that has been done without the standard of support, uh, the support of a standard. And what this means is that in a certain way, shape or form, these commercial systems today, they are hacking either the protocol or the hardware to obtain something that is really not, uh, that the standard doesn't give you. All right, let's put it that way. So for this reason, given right, the large, the, the significant interest in Wi-Fi sensing, uh, the IEEE ERU2 working group created a new test group called ERU2.11 BF back in September of 2020. And everything that this test group is doing is writing a standard, which you can see one of its first drafts on the right-hand side, that again, specifically designed to support Wi-Fi sensing. And specifically what this standard or this amendment will do is it will create basically an interface that will allow for sensing applications to request multi, um, sensing measurements of devices that could have been implemented by multiple vendors, right, which is something that we already discussed today. Uh, and then also define an interface for those applications should be tend to extract those measurements in a standardized way, will, it will lower the overhead associated with obtaining measurements, and also will allow sense applications to obtain measurements with greater control, for example, specifying parameters and consistency as well. Okay, so again, this uh, group, uh, 11 bf uh, has been around since 20, uh, 2020. Uh, we are now ab uh, about to release our draft 0.3, and you have a sneak peek there on the right-hand side, at least of its cover. Uh, and the group is scheduled to complete the amendment in late 2024, so another two years. Uh, but we expect some delay to that. 2025 will be a more realistic date. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, by the end of next year, we do expect you know, uh, to begin a certification program related to, uh, based on this amendment. So it is quite possible that by 2024, you can already find you know, solutions in the market that rely on the 11 bf And as Raf mentioned at the beginning, uh, I've been lucky enough to serve as the technical editor of this group and has been you know, uh, an incredible uh, experience. It really is you know, great people to work with. So uh, going into detail now, uh, what we are doing in Resolve 11 bf is again, developing specification to enhance the support that Wi-Fi or Resolve 11 technology gives to uh, Wi-Fi sensing. And one thing that might surprise you is that we are doing that both for conventional Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi that we use at home and our places of work that operates in 2.4 and five gigahertz and actually six gigahertz as well now but also to the uh, 60 gigahertz Eros 11 technology that sometimes go by the name of uh, YGIG. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar, but Eros 11 does have a specification that also covers 60 gigahertz. It's basically on, based, it's based on two different amendments, Eros 11 AD and Eros 11 AY. So uh, the main thing that we are doing in 11BF is well is to define a specification right for a protocol and the name of this protocol is the WLAN sensing protocol and at the same time we are developing that protocol we are developing its sister which is the DMG sensing protocol which is for the 60 gigahertz band 
And the reason why we're developing two different protocols is because radio propagation in 60 gigahertz is very different from sub seven gigahertz. And as a result, the physical layer and the MAC layer of a 2 11 ab and a Y, 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi, they are, it's directional. So um, it requires you know, a different approach. Uh, we will not cover uh, DMGs, the DMG sensing protocol today just for the sake of time. And also, again, there is a lot of correlation between the two. So uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. But there are two things that I would like to mention about uh, the DMG sensing. So the first one is the figure on the left-hand side. And what that is, and I'm pretty sure that some of you know, that is a range Doppler map, right? A range Doppler plot. And I included there to show that basically for DMG, the bandwidths that we work with are significantly wider than in sub seven gigahertz. Right? So the minimum signal bandwidth for 11 ad and 11 ay is 1.76 gigahertz. So the resolution that we can achieve with a millimeter wave Wi-Fi system is again, two orders of magnitude approximately compared to what you can do with conventional Wi-Fi. So does this guy support gesture recognition? Absolutely. Can you do breathing rate detect estimation with this guy? Absolutely. Uh, again, a lot of bandwidth. And different from sub seven that we typically rely on that concept of CSI tracking for millimeter wave Wi-Fi, we typically use conventional uh, radar technology such as range Doppler and everything and a bunch of different methods that are built on top of that. And the second thing that I wanted to, uh, to mention, which is actually I already partially mentioned it is again, it is a millimeter wave system, right? Uh, so it has huge path loss to compensate for that, we typically have, you use phase arrays. And here's an example of an implementation by Qualcomm. And this is uh, a sensing prototype that they had. So here on the bottom, uh, they have one baseband processor that is able to transmit and receive simultaneously. That is connected to two phase arrays that you can see here. I believe this is a six by six phase array. One of them transmit, the other one receives. And uh, if you look for this reference here, you'll find you know, a number of uh, demos that they have videos or sh showing different applications with that system. So super interesting, uh, a lot of value to it, but again, we will not go over just for sake of time. And uh, before we get into specification, I promise that we're getting there. Uh, there is something else that I would like to mention that is extremely important, which is that 802.11 defines specification only for the physical layer and the MAC layer. So uh, in 802.11 BF, we are not talking about machine learning. We're not talking about uh, specific ways of combining measurements. Our work ends when we obtain measurements and give those measurements to the application. Uh, we are completely agnostic to what the application does. Right, so if you came here today, you know, expecting to hear a lot of you know, machine learning, uh, neural networks, whatever, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. But again, that is out of the scope of the work we do in Linux 11. Okay, so again, let's talk about uh, specification and standard. Uh, and let's begin by talk, defining a few important concepts in, uh, in the WLAN sensing procedure. Right, so the first one is that devices that operate in the, uh, that, that participate in a WLAN sensing uh, pro procedure, uh, they can assume two different sets of roles. The first set is a sense, init is sense initiator and sensing responder. So sense initiator is a state that initiates a WLAN sensing procedure. Let's assume that you get your phone and you open an application, an app that performs some sort of sensing. Okay, so that app is going to request the 802.11 station within it, the 802.11 card, if you will, to obtain measurements about the environment. So in this case, the phone is the sense initiator. Okay, so uh, sense initiator, again, is a station, and the station, very loosely speaking, is a Wi-Fi device uh, that will be initiated the WN sense procedure. The initiator can be either an AP Right, and this is the router, the access point, or an OAP. An OAP is a client, right? Is a cell phone, a laptop, a smart TV. And 
that's and that's what we're going to see later on. Uh, that is an important definition because the procedure itself it changes whether the initiator is uh, a router, an AP, or a client. So sense initiator. Sense responder is a station that participates in a WLAN sense procedure initiated by a sense initiator. So basically it's the guy that you know the initiator speaks to that will help it to obtain measurements. And there are different ways of doing that as we're going to see next. And the second set of rules that uh, stations in the WLAN sense procedure can assume is sensing transmitter and sensing receiver. So a station that participates in WLAN sense procedure either as a, an initiator or a responder can be a sensing transmitter. So in this case, the station transmit PPDUs used for sensing measurements. And what PPDU is, PPDU stands for the physical layer protocol data unit. And that is just a packet that you transmit. Okay, so typically we refer to PPDU as packets. And a sensing receiver is a station that receives those packets sent by the sensing transmitter and performs sensing measurements. So uh, the fact that we have just two different definitions allows us to do interesting things in practice. And we need to do those different things because applications are different. So uh, specifically, there are three different things that we can do. So here on the left-hand side of the sphere, we have uh, uh, the sensing initiator, right? Which is a square. And the, on the right-hand side, we have sensing responder. And the roles of transmitter and receiver, they are defined by the colors. So in the very first case, what you do is you transmit a special type of PPDU called an NDP. I will discuss that in a second. To the other guy that acts as a station, station receiver, uh, a sensing receiver and the sensing responder, that guy obtains the measurements of the channel, basically do some light processing on it, put it in a frame and then send a report of those measurements, a summary of those measurements back to the initiator. But the initiator can also do a, GIF, a second thing, which is that instead of sending a signal for sensing, uh, it instead asks the other guy, it makes a request for the other guy, the responder, to transmit a signal to it. Again, a special signal called an NDP. So the initiator in this case makes the measurement itself. Right, so the difference between A and B here is who performs the measurement, right? In A, it is the guy who is helping you that takes the measurement. So you kind of have control of how the signal is transmitted. But after that, you are relying on the other guy to take the measurement and send a report of those measurements to you. And in the second guy, in the second case, is the opposite because you ask the other guy to help you. So the sensing responder sends the signal and you don't have much control about how that is transmitted. But then you have complete control of how uh, that measurement is made and how you process it. And then there is a third case, which in this case, you basically sound the channel, obtain measurements of the channel in both directions. So you send the special signal called NDP to the responder, and the responder also sends an NDP to you and then it also sends a measurement for you. So we have a lot of flexibility here. And why should we incorporate that in the standard? Well, I incorporate it again because we are trying to support a large number of applications, both that are being discussed now, but that might be come up in the future. And uh, this uh, approach, right, of giving flexibility of who takes the measurement uh, made sense to, to us. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is, let's talk about this guy here, NDP, just because I've been using it, but I didn't define it yet. So NDP is basically uh, a PPDU that carries no data. So it is a very short signal that basically has, you know, uh, different training sequences that you can use to acquire that packet to submit the channel, and also has some header information about that packet but it carries no data. So because it carries no data, it's pretty short. So that is a signal that we already use today uh, in Erosu.11, uh, specifically for beforming training and for ranging, that we just took the same signal and applied it to sensing. 
Okay, so NDP, no data PPDU or no data packet. Um, it, that is the type of signal that we use to do Wi-Fi sensing in the to the and BF. And the second uh, detail here is that the, the reporting in A and C, it really is optional actually. And what that means is that uh, even when you send an NDP and the responder takes the measurement, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to send a report. Right? And the reason why we did that is imagine that both your AP and your device, they're they are running the same sensing application. So in this, end, so in this case, this example, we have basically control end-to-end -end on the transmitter and the receiver. And they might exchange data not using uh, an 802.11 BF exchange, but instead they just transmit the data as uh, in an application dependent way uh, by using, for example, a data exchange. All right, so that was you know, the beginning of WLAN sensing. So let's talk about WLAN sensing procedure. So a WLAN sense procedure is nothing more than a procedure that we define that allows a state to perform, a station to perform WLAN sensing. And the WLAN sensing procedure, again, is a protocol, right? That defines how two stations talk with each other, two or more stations talk with each other in order to support a, um, in order to obtain the measurements that you need. So in this protocol, we have, uh, as of today, there are five phases to it. The first one is the sensing session setup. And that is nothing more than just a capabilities exchange. It's for one station to let the other know uh, what it supports, what it doesn't support, right? And this is pretty standard capability exchange in 802.11. Okay, so there is really, <laughs> to be honest, not much to it. But then things start getting more interesting in the second phase, which is the sensing measurement setup. And that's when an application tells the other guy what it needs. Hey, I need the measurements with 160 megahertz of bandwidth, and you know, let's say a two by two system. So that requirement, right, comes from the application to the 2.11 device, and that it is 2.11 device has to let the other one know uh, what it needs. So it is a request and response procedure that basically allow the two Wi-Fi devices to agree on a set of parameters. And we're going to talk more about this in the next slide. So once you, the two stations have agreed on a set of parameters, then we have the third phase, which is the sensing measurement instance. And this is what pays the bill basically, because this is when measurements uh, are made the, with the parameters that were negotiated before and allows you to, uh, and those measurements uh, eventually come to the application and the application does whatever it needs to do with them. And then after that, we also have termination sessions. So this is basically when the station say, hey, I don't need more measurements and, and that's it. So uh, we won't talk much about, uh, our focus today will be basically on the second and the third phases of this protocol, just because you know that's really the most interesting, <laughs> the phases that are more interesting. And again, as I mentioned before, the essential measurement setup is when you agree operational parameters and those operational parameters uh, are given uh, an ID to it, which is called the measurement setup ID. So just so we have you know, a better understanding of everything that we can do with 802.11 and WLAN sensing procedure, I have this figure here that exemplifies uh, the measurement setup sensing measurement setup and sensing measurement instances. All right, so in this example here, we have you know, one station that comes up with MAC address A, and it negotiates a given set of parameters with you know, its sensing responder. And basically that can be again, channel bandwidth, uh, number of transmit antennas, number of receive antennas, uh, resolution. Uh, do you need you know, the, the channel estimate to have eight bits or 10 bits, for example. And once you negotiate in that measurement setup, you have several measurement instances. And so that's when you'll be taking measurements, right? Measurement one, measurement two. And those measurements, they are labeled with the ID of that setup and also with an ID for the measurement instance. So we have one and two, for example. And then in this example, we have a second application that comes up also with that station that negotiates a second set of parameters, right? So that can be, for example, 
uh, an AP in your house that is supporting both a, an application for motion detection and then another application that, I don't know, is helping you know, your smart TV to detect movement and gestures in a... Awesome, we didn't know as much. So I hope that that's not a sign that I'm speaking too much, but we are running out of time, right? So I'm going to speed things up. Yeah, it'll be great. I think, you know, if you can leave at least 10 minutes for question, Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so probably cover 10 minutes. And I have, another 10 I have three slides. Q &A. All right. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so yeah, so I'm going to cut things short just so we have more more questions, but but anyway, we, we saw the, uh, the that sense measurement setup concept, right? And then we have now, let's talk about how uh, measurements are obtained. And I can cut you short, but typically uh, this is how uh, sensing measurements are actually obtained. And again, as defined in, in, in the protocol. So this is uh, the way that we use when uh, an AP is the sense initiator, okay? So once you have an agreement to take measurements, right? We have a sensing measurement instance. And in this case here, for when an AP is the initiator, that's called a trigger-based uh, sensing measurement instance. And how it happens is uh, the two devices, they agree on what we call a sensing availability window, which is a time window when that time measurements are, are going to happen. And when that window comes, the AP sends a polling frame to the stations that are supposed to participate. In this example here, we had four stations that were supposed to, to obtain measurements there. But as you can see in this example, only three out of the four states respond to the poll. So in other words, the fourth one, I don't know, we don't know what happened to it. it possibly you no know, went to sleep, the user turned off, but for whatever reason, it didn't appear. So the AP hears the three CTS to self, it knows only, and it knows that only stations one, two, and three are still available. And in this example, stations one and two, they are transmitters, and station three is a receiver. So after that polling phase, we have uh, two important phases. The first one is called the NDPA phase. And in the NDPA phase, what happens is that the AP is the transmitter. So the AP sends something that we call an NDPA, which is an NDP announcement frame. And basically what that announcement frame does is lets the receiver know, hey, an NDP is coming up. So it sends an NDPA and SIFS after it sends an NDP. And SIFS is uh, just a time spacing that is either 10 or 16 microseconds. It depends on the frequency possibly too much detail from what we want. But anyway, so once that AP sends an NDP, station three obtains measurements. And then uh, on the second or the third phase, uh, we have what you call the trigger uh, phase. And in this case, who transmits the signals are the clients, not the AP. So the AP sends a trigger frame that basically triggers the transmission of the clients. So in this case, station one and two, they send an NDP and allows the AP to estimate the channel. So every time that you want to make a measurement, you're going to go through something that looks like this, right? Uh, depending obviously whether you're transmitting, measuring the channel in the uplink from the client to the AP or in the downlink from the AP to the client. So you, you don't necessarily have both NDP and trigger frame phases in a sense measurement instance. Again, it only depends on the configuration that you have. So this is really how you obtain measurements. And then as a result of that, we have this beautiful graph here that we don't have time to go into detail, but explains exactly uh, what happens uh, to obtain measurements, okay? So what happens is that, uh, an application talks to the controller of the root and the management entity of the device saying, hey, I want measurements. And that triggers a measurement setup process. And you can see the flow here. So everything that is between MLME and MLME is what goes over there roughly. So it has a request and a response to that, uh, to that request. And then you have you know, the polling phase, the NDPA phase, the trigger phase, and then uh, 
possibly measurements as well in the determination phase. Okay, so again, it's a lot of detail, but roughly that's the idea of what happens. And then for the unknown trigger base, that's what we use when the client is actually the, uh, who initiates the process. Uh, we do something different, but actually simpler. We don't have that polling phase. And also we don't have, uh, we do have two different phases, downlink and uplink, but they are always present. So in this case, the AP just sends an NDPA, the, that announcement frame and an NDP that allows the AP to measure the channel. And then the AP immediately also sends an NDP back that allows the, the receiver to estimate the channel. And uh, so roughly, you know, again, that's what the WLAN sensing procedure does in a whole lot more detail. Uh, believe me, that is, you know, 125 page document so far. Uh, but that is the main I, I idea of what we are trying to achieve. And just so we have more uh, time for questions, I'm going to basically stop, skip a few slides and stop here. Uh, and we don't even have to go over everything in this slide, but one point that I would like to make is here at the very end, which is that uh, this was a super short introduction to Wi-Fi sensing. If you are interested in learning more, uh, we had uh, a tutorial in this year's IEEE ICC. Uh, so if you're interested in the material, just get in touch with me. I'll be happy to send you the slides. Uh, now we can also find a few uh, academic papers on 802.11bf uh, on, uh, I, I'm not sure if they are already on IEEE Explorer or not, but at least if you Google it, you can find, they can be good source of information. Uh, but also you might be interested in just going you know, to, uh, to a triple E itself and taking a look at everything that we do there. And it's, the site of the 2.11 uh, working group is there on the page. And one thing that is important for everyone to know is that you know, everything that is discussed and presented in 2.11 uh, is public. So you can go to that uh, link there and basically have access you know, for years and years of 802.11 contributions uh, that you, you probably get significantly more information than what you want, but you know, nothing like going to the source for, for it. And if you get stuck or if you have any questions, again, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Just reach out. But uh, Raf, as promised, I think we have more than 10 minutes, <laughs> at least 13 minutes to, to talk some more. All right, uh, wonderful, uh, Claudia. Uh, first, thank you, thank you, uh, sure. our speaker. Um, okay, so you know we have a um, little bit over ten minutes. Um, so you know, I sorry I interrupted somebody. You know, when asked a question, please, you know, if you are around, please ask that question. Give that first priority for that person who asked that question. Are you around? Okay. Otherwise, you know, anybody, any any questions? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, okay. I'm going to ask a yeah, I have question. One, question. So, yes. I saw Claudio in the examples. Like, uh, sorry, we cannot hear you well. Can you oh. speak up? Can okay. you hear me now? Yes. Much yeah. better. So, yeah. yeah, I just saw, um, I think it's like um, my microphone's not good. It's a range issue. <laughs> <laughs> So in the example you show, it's like um, the APE talking to multiple stations. I was wondering in the measurement phase, is it actually like a pairwise or you actually have multiple station active? Do you guys consider those like interference or always like quiet one-to-one -one, or you can have one sent to many or many sent to one, those kind of scenarios during oh, the measurement? Oh, yeah, awesome question. So, uh, so the first thing is when the initiator is a client, right? So for example, if the application is your phone, uh, your phone only talks to one person, right? Which is the AP, which is associated with. So, uh, so in that case, again, if the initiator is a client, unfortunately, you are only able to obtain one measurement, right? Which is, again, to the AP, which is associated with. To an extent, we are also developing 11BF uh, you know, some other mechanisms, other pr procedures that would enable us to do better than that. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to go over here. They're uh, a bit too advanced. 
But answering your question, right, we are able to uh, take multiple measurements at the same time when the EP is the initiator. And why is that? Uh, that is because uh, in Erotsuda 11, we support multi-user MIMO, right? So again, given that 11BF comes after, and you know, is defined multi-user MIMO, in 11BF, we are uh, relying on multi-user MIMO procedures. So everything that you can see here, for example, in this uh, trigger phase situation here, both stage one and stage two, they do transmit simultaneously, right? And their transmissions are synchronized by this trigger frame that the AP sends. So uh, do you have, do these two transmissions interfere with each other? Uh, yeah, I mean, when you look, taking into account, right, a lot of uh, real life implementation issues, there will be some level of interference, but that is the same level, right, as you would expect in a multi-user MIMO transmission. So again, everything here that you have multiple users transmitting at the same time would rely on MIMO. I see, but that, that's quite efficient though. Yeah, you're using the underlying. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Um, I have a question. So I'm wondering like in, in B, uh, there is going to be a multi-link operation to reduce the latency. So will this BF uh, sensing uh, will incorporate some aspects of it to kind of quick sensing, kind of? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And unfortunately, the answer is we're still discussing that in 11BF. So as of today, draft 0 0.3, we do not have anything related to multi-link operation, uh, but that might change, absolutely. So yeah, so as of now, Oh, oh, it's yeah. a single link operation. A okay. single link, absolutely. Yeah, and just so people can follow the, the question. So uh, in Wi-Fi 7, right? So it's something that is not in the market yet. Uh, they define something called a multi-link operation, which basically allows a device to operate in multiple bands at the same time. So for example, can uh, your cell phone with a router can develop, can establish links in, let's say in the 2.4 and five gigahertz bands. And that helps quite a lot with latency because you know if the channel is busy in 2.4, you can very quickly jump to five. Uh, but anyway, again, that's something that's coming on Wi-Fi 7, but we yeah, we haven't incorporated that in level B, at least not yet. I put a question in the chat. Oh sh I'm very sorry, but I did not have my chat open. Uh, um, there was one question. By Alon? Yes. Okay, Alon. Uh, uh, isn't the poor spatial resolution below seven uh, gigahertz cripple the number of potential applications? Yes, exactly. So that's one thing that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation. So uh, you are simply not able, right? Again, this is physics to support, right? Super high resolution applications with a 48 megahertz application, um, I'm sorry, with a 40 megahertz bandwidth or 80 megahertz bandwidth, uh, you have to be realistic, right? In the sense of what applications you can support. So yeah, if you want to do, you know, gesture recognition, for example, Wi-Fi sensing might not be the best option for you or not to be possible at all. Uh, and that is fine. There are other applications that can, can make use, right? Of Wi-Fi sensing still. Uh, if, you know, uh, range resolution really is, you know, uh, if your application does have a high range resolution requirement, you really have to look into either UWB, right, which has a 500 megahertz bandwidth, or even into FMCW and YGIG in the millimeter wave band uh, that would give you a range of resolution of a few centimeters at the cost of range, right? The maximum range of detection. So yeah, it is a trade-off and it's pretty much you know, like comparing, you know, BLE with Wi-Fi and, you know, LTE technology and ask which one is better. Uh, it really depends on the application. So it's pretty similar with Wi-Fi Sense. Thank you. Sure.
One more question, maybe uh, diff on a different uh, aspect of it, uh, aspect of privacy. Yeah. Uh, having, you know, if I roam or just, to, you know, walk to a place that has a, a Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have any mechanism here to prevent, if I don't want my device to be, to be used as a sensor, can, can I as a user will be able to disable it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as we saw, right, in the W license procedure, everything begin, it begins with a sensing measurement setup, right? And that is a request and response procedure. So yes, that will be uh, uh, that will be possible, right? For a device, for example, your cell phone, even if it is able to support Wi-Fi sensing, to say no, I don't want to do Wi-Fi sensing now. Uh, we haven't defined all the interfaces up to the user yet, but all the mechanisms necessary in the lower layers support that uh, they they can be found in 11BF today. So absolutely, that, that is something that we do take in, are taking into account. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a question. This is Dave Parancic. Um, You mentioned some of the benefits of uh, sensing at uh, 60 megahertz using DMG. And my observation <laughs> is that those 60 megahertz or 60 gigahertz uh, systems are not too widely deployed. Do you have any sense that um, that there's a, a, a going to be an emergent greater use of those frequencies for Wi-Fi? That's an awesome question. And uh, so uh, uh, two quick things. So the first one, David, is that uh, 60 gigahertz FMCW systems are becoming quite popular. So uh, you can buy sensing, not Wi-Fi sensing, but you no know, conventional radar FMCW uh, modules for 60 gigahertz fairly easily. So that's one point that I wanted to flag. Uh, second point that I want to flag, yes, uh, YGIG really didn't, uh, uh, wasn't a huge commercial success, let's put it that way. Uh, but IEEE 802 in general is still very bullish about it to the point there now uh, we have discussed, started discussions on Wi-Fi 8. Okay, so it's not a Wi-Fi 6 or Wi-Fi 7, but Wi-Fi 8 that should be available um, geez, six years from now. And believe it or not, one of the things that we are uh, discussing now, so again, that's still in the phase discussion, is to actually extend Wi-Fi 8 to incorporate 60 gigahertz. And that will be completely different from what we did with DMG and EDMG, right? So in DMG and EDMG, it's a completely separate system, it's independent of sub-7. And now for Wi-Fi 8, again, those are discussions, yeah, but we are, thinking of combining them and basically doing something similar to what LTE did, which is to have a single waveform covering all the bands except for scaling factors. Yeah. So we are still very much working on it and, uh, and we need spectrum, right? And if you really need spectrum, uh, you know, a six gigahertz band only comes every once in a blue moon. So 60 gigahertz, it, we're still pushing for it. And David, if you have more questions about it, I'll be happy to, to you know, put you in that discussion offline. Great, thanks very much. Sure, no problem. All right, it's about time. Any, any other questions? All right, if there is no other questions, let's... Uh, uh, thank you, our speaker. You can go to the reaction uh, and put your... <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Claudio. Claudia. You know, it's a very interesting talk, a very, you know, uh, engaging talk. Um, very good. Um, thanks for, you know, taking the time to, you know, uh, give this talk to our chapter as well as many other chapters were here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Rev. And again, it was a pleasure. It was really a pleasure for me. And if I can be of help, if you want to continue discussion offline, you know, just feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions yeah. or discuss any topics. Yeah.
Yeah, th thank you again. Uh, sure. do, can you uh, 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 share your presentation, the PowerPoint deck? Yeah, I can send you the okay. slides. Okay, please do. And then for everybody else, uh, uh, you know, the next few days, this will be posted on our website, uh, uh, Oregon Comstock. You go uh, uh, Google uh, Oregon Comstock, you'll get to the site, and uh, in, under Meeting Archives, uh, you can get the link to the YouTube video and as well as the uh, uh, the PowerPoints. Uh, thank you all, and all right. have a very good evening. Thank you.